Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day, to not be satisfied with throwing a little religion into our lives as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this series continues, in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, from friends, from others. They were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we consider a love strong enough to hurt and a question, how can God? We'll hear from Della Healy, a friend and writer, as she talks about something she wishes were different in relation to Elizabeth. Also, a friend Eileen Chambers will join us and talk about her mother in the faith. Right now though, think about love as we hear from somebody who's gone through the pain of a divorce. This is Gateway to Joy 29. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about a love strong enough to hurt. In my last talk, we considered one of the big hurts in life, divorce. And I read a part of a card that I had received from a woman who had been recently divorced. I want to read you a little bit more of what she said there. As the time of year approaches when we begin talking about going home for the holidays, these things become even more real to me. Where is my home ultimately? My home is where Christ is. My apartment has become a home because I share it with him. As I've worked to make it a comfortable place to be, I've discovered new ways of expressing the gift of hospitality that he has nurtured in me through the years. God has made a home for me in order to share that home with others. The title that I've just given my talk is A Love Strong Enough to Hurt. Did you ever get a spanking from either your mother or father? And then they said to you, This hurts me more than it hurts you. Did you believe them? No child ever believes that, does he? But when that child becomes a parent, he knows that it is absolutely true. Have you ever thought about the fact that when we hurt, God hurts? We read in Isaiah 53, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That should be a transforming truth for us, to realize that we don't suffer alone, that we don't suffer anything that God himself does not share with us. And if God allows us to be hurt, then God knows that he himself is also going to be hurt. Would he do it lightly? Would he do it without deep and eternal reasons? He never does anything for nothing. He would never allow anything to touch us except what comes through his loving permission. So this business of a love strong enough to hurt deals with the very love of God. God loves us enough to say no. He loves us enough to allow us to be hurt. As any wise father has to allow his child sometimes to be hurt, He, in fact, has to inflict the hurt sometimes in the form of a spanking, depriving the child of dessert, sending him to bed early. The child cries. He's hurt. He doesn't understand why his father is doing this. And his father can only say, this hurts me worse than it hurts you. Someday you'll know that it was for your good. The loss of somebody we love, whether by death or divorce, or otherwise, brings us to the brink of the abyss of mystery. If we wrestle, as most of us are forced to do, with the question of God in the matter, we're bound to ask why he found it necessary to withdraw such a good gift. We will not get the whole answer, but certainly one answer is the necessity of being reminded that wherever our treasure is, there will our hearts be also. If we put all our eggs into the basket of of earthly life and earthly affections, we haven't much left when the basket falls. 
Christians, being citizens of another country, subjects of a heavenly king, are supposed to set their affections there rather than here, a lesson few of us learn without mortal anguish. It's a lesson that I have thought I had learned, not once but several times, and I find that it has to be reviewed again and again. Sheldon Van Auken's love for his wife, Davy, as he writes in A Severe Mercy, was an all-consuming love, passionate, romantic, and, as his friend C.S. Lewis pointed out to him, selfish. In their pre-Christian days, a short-sighted view of happiness led them to exclude all others, to the point of Van Auken's refusal even to allow children to mar what he and Davy had. When they became Christians, he began to feel that she was holier than necessary, and he began to see God as his rival. They had set up what they called a shining barrier between them and all that might come between them and their love. A child he saw as a threat to the unity and the oneness that they had. So when he began to see God as his rival, because he had a sneaking suspicion that his wife Davy loved God, more than she loved him, that was a dangerous position. She was, as he said, holier than necessary. So one night, as he tells in his book, Davy offered up her life for her husband in order that his soul might be fulfilled. Hadn't they had all that anyone could ask for fulfillment? Davy knew they hadn't. She had found her fulfillment in Christ, and she longed that her husband should find his there. It was a drastic prayer that she prayed, one that she knew would cost her something. Have you ever prayed prayers which you discovered later cost a high price? It did cost her something. God accepted her surrender, and exactly a year later, she died. A strange answer, someone would say, the end of a perfect marriage. Stripped at last of the object of a passion that had shut out all else, Van Auken did, through much anguish, find the fulfillment for which Davy had prayed. Her death was what his friend Lewis called a severe mercy. Is it possible that God sometimes takes from us a love for someone else because we love too much? I really don't think so. Surely it's impossible to love too much, for love is from God, who is love. Usually, I think we love too little and too sentimentally. Our love, God-given though it be, is usually mixed up with possessiveness and selfishness. It needs strengthening and purifying. Human love is often inordinate, which means disorderly, unregulated, unrestrained, not limited to the usual bounds. If we love someone more than we love God, it's worse than inordinate. It's idolatry. And idolatry, you know, we're told in Scripture, is a very great sin. When God is first in our hearts, all other loves are in order and find their rightful place. If God is not first, other loves, even those which are in no sense sexual, easily turn into self-gratification and therefore destroy both the lover and the beloved. Van Auken had constructed a world for himself and the woman he loved, and thrown up around it what they called the shining barrier. Shutting out all else, they determined to make things work their way. It was a rigid structure, perilously maintained, and when Christ came into their lives, it cracked. Any man who falls on that stone will be dashed to pieces, says Luke in chapter 20, verse 18. And if it falls on a man, he will be crushed by it. Lewis helped Van Auken to see that his very agony was the mercy of God. In his mercy, God stands silently by and permits us to agonize. In other words, he loves us enough, strongly enough, irresistibly enough to allow us to be hurt. When a mother has to see her little boy go off to school for the first time, she knows that he may be bullied, 
She knows that he may be lonely. She knows that he may cry the minute he gets in the door and realizes that mama is not there. If that child is going to learn independence and become a man, he will have to be hurt. For you and me, God desires maturity, spiritual strength, a sinewy, robust faith which can resist the blows that life will deal out. He must allow us to be hurt in order to come to know him. In order to experience that mercy which may be truly severe. Francis Thompson's poem, The Hound of Heaven, describes a lonely man's attempt to flee him and to find solace elsewhere. Do you remember the poem? I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. Then he goes on to tell how he tried romantic love. He tried the love of children. He tried nature. And in each case, he felt that he was rejected. Romantic love rejected him. Children rejected him. Even nature seemed cold and distant. While... Still with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet. At last the hound chases him to earth. He hears a voice around him like a bursting sea which says, All which I took from thee I did but take not for thy harms, but that thou shouldst seek it in my arms. Gateway to Joy 29, a love strong enough to hurt. Later on, we'll hear from Eileen Chambers, a writer and friend of Elizabeth, who talks about her mother in the faith and about Elizabeth's first kiss. Also, uh, right now, let's hear from Della Healy. She worked in the movie industry and wrote a screenplay. She worked on it for many years. She traveled to Ecuador, where Elizabeth had lived, and knew her well. You know, I can uh, speak with someone, say, from church, who's maybe in their 50s, and they don't know who Elizabeth is. I think that she is, is because her books are living testimonies, and she was such a superb writer that in every way you can't not benefit from all of her books and all of her writings, and uh, she was so forthright in everything that she said, and uh, consequently you could, you know, take it to the bank, as they say. Everything was scripturally based, and she was so schooled in the Word, that in in every way, you know, you're, you're learning. Della Healy, a friend of Elizabeth and a writer, A little bit later, we'll hear from another writer, Eileen Chambers, about her mother in the faith. Right now, though, it's Gateway to Joy 30. How can God... Hey, do we really believe that God will answer our prayers, even about some impossibilities, so-called, that we may face? Do you ever sit down and worry and wonder and puzzle and ponder over how in the world God can possibly answer your prayers Just this past week, I'd been praying for what seemed to me like an impossibility. My daughter and her husband and family live in California, where I understand real estate is almost as expensive as it is where we live in the Boston area. And they're living in a rented house, which costs them what to me is just a breathtaking sum. And they have been paying mortgage payments on a house back in Mississippi that they were not able to sell when they moved from Mississippi to California. So the whole thing has been looking to me like an absolute impossibility. And as so often happens, whenever I'm going to speak or write on a subject for other people, in other words, when I'm going to be dishing out what seems to me to be God's truth to other people, God has the most incredible way of putting his finger exactly on the sorest spot in my own spiritual life and saying to me, are you trusting me for this? You're telling all these other people what they're supposed to do. 
What about you? Do you really believe that I can provide housing and money to pay for housing for Valerie and Walt and those five children? Do you really believe that? Well, my answer is yes, Lord, I really believe you can, but I don't see how. And that's the question for today. How can God possibly do this? Do you remember Francis Thompson's poem, part of which I quoted in my last talk? The last stanza says this, All which I took from thee, I did but take not for thy harms, but just that thou shouldst find it in my arms. All which thy child's mistake fancies as lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Now how can God store for us at home things which we think are lost? Maybe in some weird way material things, but everything we have lost? Did we only fancy it as lost? How could it be? If it's a child or a person, then we can believe that God can bring them to heaven and keep them there so that we will meet them someday. But all that we've lost, what about that? How does it work? I'd like to remind you of some of the questions that were asked in the Bible. I've been making a list of these questions for several years. It's very interesting to see the number of subjects that they cover. I'm going to read you this list of questions, and then we're going to go back and look at the subjects which are touched on by each question. For example, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Has your God been able to save you from the lions? Can these bones live? How is the Lord to save Jerusalem? Is this your care for the widow? Which way are we to turn? Why wait any longer for him to help us? Where can we buy bread? How can a man be born when he is old? How can you give me living water? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? How is it that this untrained man can teach? What is the good of that for such a crowd? Who will roll away the stone? I'm sure you can find some more if you want to study your Bible. Do you detect a note of sarcasm, even a sardonic note in some of these questions? A good many of them reveal that spirit, don't they? Has your God been able to save you from the lions? How is the Lord to save Jerusalem? How can a man be born when he is old? Just very obvious questions that you and I would ask too if we had been told the things which these people were told. But that first question, can God spread a table in the wilderness? It touches on the supply of material needs. What do you need today? Money? Food? New clothes? A car? A house? A job? Does it look impossible to you that God can take care of that situation? Can God spread a table even in the wilderness? Yes, he can. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with joy. Second question, has your God been able to save you from the lions? Well, that's danger for you, isn't it? Not many of us are going to be tempted by being thrown into a lion's den, but there are other dangers. I think of the dangers that faced my daughter when she was a little girl running around in the jungle. There were things like poisonous snakes, of course. There were wild animals. There were scorpions. There were electric eels and crocodiles and stingrays in the river where she swam. What could I do about that? There was no protection. If I was going to be in the place where God wanted me, someone would, might say, well, I would have gotten out of there as fast as I could. I wouldn't think of raising a baby in a place like that. But if it happens to be God's appointment, that's where you stay. And I believe that the God who could save Daniel from hungry lions could protect Valerie from poisonous snakes. The third question, can these bones live again? 
Maybe you're looking at something that looks absolutely hopeless, useless. Something which has died. A project, perhaps, that you poured your heart and soul into. And it looks like a pile of dry bones. What's the use? Why do I bother to serve God? Can these bones live again? Can he make something out of this? The truth is he can. Fourth question. How is the Lord to save Jerusalem? Jerusalem looked unsalvageable at that time. What is it in your life that looks unsalvageable? Things that we feel that we cannot possibly do anything with, that they're just a dead loss. God can do something with those things. Do you know that little chorus? Something beautiful, something good. All my confusions he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. Don't worry too much about the how the Lord is going to save this unsalvageable thing. Just trust him. Next question, is this your care for the widow? This was the question that the prophet asked to God when the widow in whose home he had been staying had a son who died, her beloved son. Is this your care for the widow? God had promised to take care of her. Kind of a strange way to do it, wasn't it? What has God allowed to happen in your life that strikes you as being a very strange kind of care? How can I say he loves me? How can you call this care? Yet, if you remember the story, God had a miracle in mind for that widow which strengthened her faith far more than if the child had never died. God enabled the prophet to breathe life into that child and he was resurrected. Which way are we to turn is the next question. Who of us hasn't asked that question many times? Perplexity, the need for guidance. I talked to my daughter last night in California about the fact that they were going to look at a house yesterday, and I wanted to know how that had worked out. And so she told me that they saw the house and they decided they didn't like it as well as the one that they were in. So now they need guidance as to whether or not they should try to buy the house that they're in or whether they should keep on renting it. I don't know what your situation may be, but there's perplexity. What's the best thing to do? Maybe it has to do with an aging relative. Shall we try to take care of him at home? Shall we put him in a nursing home? Which way are we to turn? What kind of medical treatment should we have for this child? Which doctor should we go to? What college shall we encourage our son to choose? Which way are we to turn? I don't know how God may answer your question, but I believe with all my heart that he will. Then there's the question, where can we buy bread? Some of you hostesses have had the experience of saying, what in the world am I going to feed all these people? It's amazing how usually God enables you to find something where you didn't think there was anything. You can make something out of nothing. How can a man be born when he is old? Well, if ever there was a human impossibility, it's that a man should enter again into his mother's womb and be born, which is what Nicodemus saw as an impossibility and asked the question of Jesus. And Jesus explained that he was talking about spiritual rebirth. How can you give me living water, said the Samaritan woman. I think in her question there was the implication there is no such thing. Living water? Well, if there is, give it to me so I won't ever have to come back here and draw this water again. I'll get out of a lot of work. The hows of God's dealings are beyond us. Gateway to Joy 30. How can God? Well, before we go, let's hear from writer Eileen Chambers as she talks about her mother in the faith and about a first kiss. I suspect there are countless folks out there just like me who see Elizabeth Elliot as a mother in the faith. She had this relentless knack of telling you what you needed to hear or probably did not want to hear. 
Take feminism, for example, or premarital sex. Did you know that the first man she ever kissed was Jim Elliott on the day that he proposed to her? Or take whining. Elizabeth was a no veil of tears girl. How about doing your own thing versus obeying God? Or as she is very well known for, and as I have previously mentioned, the fact that heartache and suffering are inherent in the Christian walk. Writer and friend of Elizabeth, Eileen Chambers. Eileen is the screenwriter for Valerie Elliott Shepard's book, Devotedly. Well, it looks as though our time is coming to an end, but thanks for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you got some exercise today wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. Hey, if you get a chance, write a review for us sometime. Amy Shopper writes, I love how God has used Elizabeth and her ministry to teach women how to live as Titus 2, 3 through 6 calls us to live. We don't need look at me teaching, but instead a look to Christ teaching and leading us to desire holiness that glorifies Him. This podcast points us to what truly matters. Well, thank you for those kind words. Be sure to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. And until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Thank you.